Welcome to Books Tapio TV. I'm John Purcell and I'm here with biologist Tim Lowe to talk about his new book, Where Song Began. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, John. I've um, been reading um, your book and the long history of birds in Australia. Uh, tell us about because the actual, like it goes back to, to dinosaur years, um, the, the history of birds in Australia. How long have the birds that we know been around? The ones that we recognise? Depends on the group of birds. Parrots, probably tens of millions of years. Tens of millions. We know the lyre birds, over 20 million. Uh, where some birds like, say, magpie, probably no more than 2 million. So it's all over the place, depending on the birds. Yeah, so we've got this mixture of really, really old groups and really young groups. I mean, including some that have evolved in Australia recently and others that have just wandered in recently. So crows, silver eyes, we know they're from northern hemisphere groups that may not have been here very long. But we, would we recognise some of the parrots? Like if we, if we were to, to go travelling back in time, so many million years, would you, would oh, you go? Oh, that's years. A, that's a oh yeah, no, all this budgerigar fossils. Pro probably you could go back three, four, maybe five million years and you probably like cockatoos, you probably go, oh yeah, there's a cockatoo. I mean, the, the live bird, where the fossil's more than 20 million years old, it was smaller than anyone we've got today. I mean, we don't, we can't tell from the bones whether we instantly say that's a live bird, but yeah, we probably would. Um, the book, um, your book where the song began, has been incredibly successful and a word of mouth success. The Booktopia has been packing up boxes and shipping them out all over Australia and word seems to be spreading uh, uh, about it. How long have you worked on this book? That's a terrible question. It embarrasses me to say we've been on it for 10 years. <laughs> it's a ridiculous amount of time. But I've looked back on early drafts where I had all the chapters worked out and looked at it and thought, oh, that would have been such a, a bland book. So it, it, did, it did benefit. And one way in which it benefited was actually new research just kept coming out and I kept thinking, oh, this is good. So the, 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 the Australian contribution to the birds of the world, the more research just kept showing it was bigger and bigger. Well, that, that was uh, so interesting, rough from the rough from word go. Just um, how much information was pointing to the source of, of all these birds coming from what was, the, the, I suppose, the, um, the breaking off of... Uh, Gondwana. Yeah, um, yeah, and the splitting away from Antarctica and South America and that bit which we, we, we know as Australia. Um, how long ago that, that that happened and how long ago those birds began to, to sort of... Um, uh, become the, the birds that we know today, mainly because of the arid nature of, of Australia? Look, what makes Australia so important is that the songbirds originated here. So this is the largest group of birds. And just to have that one group originating in Australia means that in an English country garden, the nightingales, thrushes, robins, swallows, mm. all have Australian ancestors. All these North American birds, cardinals, blue jays, chickadees, ha, ha they all had Australian ancestors. Whether there was some special reason why Australia produced them, probably not. It was probably just that when Gondwana broke up, it had these little little birds, and somehow, somewhere, one of them just evolved to innovations that just made it incredibly successful. And Australia really, there were waves of birds coming out of Australia. So we know that um, uh, if you look at, say, the, the birds in Africa that you can trace back to Australia, you've had oh, at least a dozen times that birds have spread between Australia and Africa. So we were one, one expression that's been, that's been used is describing Australia as a, as a pump, pumping out birds. Um, so you describe uh, the, English, the English coming out in the 19th century bringing out songbirds as if they're bringing something new to Australia, but they've already been here. They, they, they've gone. They've gone. We gave them to you. Well, that's right. So there was that whole idea of terra nullius, the idea that you could, <coughs> you could take over Australia, that it was a backwater. So the old, old thinking was that um, all the important biological creations and the important people were in Europe, or if not in Europe, in North America, that the Northern Hemisphere was a powerhouse of evolution. I mean, Charles Darwin, in his book about evolution, he said that because you've got more land masses joined together in the North, Africa, Asia, Europe, you have more competition among species, therefore evolution going to a higher degree. So that fitted in really well with the, you know, the, the European sense of superiority. And then they come out to Australia and things were so weird that it, it seemed quite reasonable, which then we looked at the marsupials to think that this was a backwater. Um, but the weird thing is that we find that from the DNA evidence that yeah, but ha so almost half the world's 
bird species, you can trace them back to Australia because we gave the world parrots and a lot of pigeons came out of here as well. So is it, do you think there's some part of your success with this book in that Australian element that, come on, it's obvious we're, we're awesome and we also gave you birds too? <laughs> is there some... Oh yeah, so um, yeah, it's a play on the old idea that um, you know, Australia was meant to be second best, you know, we, we looked up to England, looked up to America and that, that um, uh, sort of cultural backwardness, we, we've overcome that, so, you know, we've got so many Australian actors and directors doing well in Hollywood, so many good novelists that we no longer feel that cultural cringe, but it's still part of our character, that idea that, you know, we know that in the past the best things came from, first really from England, later from America, so to be able to say that in the Northern Hemisphere got its best birds from us, that's, you know, that's <laughs> obviously it's to our um, sense of nationalism, but also it is just it is just an amazing story, the idea that Australia, for birds, was the most important continent. I mean, that, that really does take something to digest. And it's not a new finding. Like, I'm not the first person to say it. I was seeing it in these journal articles, but realising this just hasn't got out. Australians yeah. don't realise this. Um, one of the, thing, the other thing that I found interesting was the relationship between the eucalypts and, and Australian birds, and the, 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 the way in which the, um, the poor soil um, created rich nectar. Um, which then was spread, and the way in which the birds spread um, spread the pollen, as opposed to the way that insects would spread pollen. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, so there was a theory that came out a few years ago saying that in Australia you've got heaps of sunshine, so that the trees can photosynthesise really well, but there's essential minerals are so lacking that they're just producing more carbon than they can use. So the idea that it's very cheap for them to produce nectar because they've got nothing better to do with the sugars that they're photosynthesizing anyway. And then another idea you can put with that is that if you look at the trees in the Northern Hemisphere, when you had the ice ages, you know, cold, warm, cold, warm over the last two million years, we know that after the ice sheets retreated in the Northern Hemisphere, the trees just moving north and they had seeds that were moved around by birds. If you look at eucalyptus seeds, there's nothing about them to help them move. And it's actually the pollen that moves instead. And that if you have mobile pollen, that can substitute for mobile seeds to some extent because eucalypts hybridise. So if I'm a eucalypt growing here and there's a new ice age coming, it's getting hotter and drier. If a bird brings me pollen from a hotter and drier place, then I'll have offspring that are adapted to a hotter, drier climate. And that if you think of a flowering eucalypt, there can be hundreds of birds coming and going, insects as well, so they're not only pollinated by birds, there can be flying foxes at night. There's pollen coming from all over the place, so that if a eucalypt produces a, a couple of hundred seedlings come up, only one or two of those will survive. But the number of parents, the number of pollen sources, might be like a hundred different trees from all different distances, and that if a drought comes through, the only seedling that survives may be the one who's you know, the pollen that came from 200 kilometres where it was hotter and drier, so that this pollination system is an alternative to having mobile seeds. Yeah, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating because the, um, the, the, the length of, of, um, of the, how far the, where these birds were coming from, so to go into Tasmania, the, what was it, the, the rocket parrot? Well, the, yeah, the swift parrot. Swift so, parrot. So, so yeah, they leave Tassie every winter. If there's not enough nectar for them in the box ironbark woodlands in Victoria, they keep going to New South Wales. In a really bad year, they get up to Queensland. And I've seen them in Barden, which is almost an inner suburb. I mean, it's close to where the governor of Queensland has his, his or her residence. So look at, you know, Park, looking at these parrots that have flown all the way from Tasmania. When they migrate back to Tasmania, they breed on blue gums. And the blue gums in Victoria are flowering at the same time they come back. And so they've got the potential to carry Victorian pollen to Tasmanian trees. And you've actually got the DNA study of Tass Tassie blue gums where the experts are saying, look, here's genetic structure in this population, one population in eastern Tasmania where they're suggesting that it was swift parrots bringing pollen from Victoria that has gotten into that population. Now, if Tassie gets hotter and drier, that's not, not a bad thing to have those Victorian genes. Now, I want to get onto the screeches. They're, 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 when, when Australia um, First Fleet came um, to Australia, um, the parrots and the, the noise that they, they made um, had them shooting them out of the, out of the trees. What is it about um, Australia? Is it, is, it the, is it the sugar they're getting? What is it that makes these birds so loud and so, so um, screechy? If you're a bird and you live on insects, you've got to spend all your time searching for it. 
uh, if you eat seeds or fruit, you eat it and it's gone. If you're a nectar feeder and you've got a, a eucalypt just covered in blossom or something like these grevillea shrubs, your sugar supply is just sitting there. I mean, the, these grevilleas all, I mean, the cultivated ones will breed for months, but even a wild one, it could be, could have nectar there for six weeks. You don't need any skill, no talent to find that nectar. I mean, bright flowers, tree covered in blossom. But, so the skill you need is not to find it, but to make sure other birds don't get the nectar. And so a nectar, abundant nectar rewards aggression. It's, it's the bully birds. It's like the seagulls getting bread. You don't need any talent to find bread in a park, but it's the bullies that get the most bread. So it's, it's you call it the seagull principle. <laughs> Thank you very much for talking with us. It's, um, it's a very interesting book and I um, recommend it to everybody to get, get hold of a copy. Um, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks, John. We've got great birds, haven't we? We have wonderful birds. Tim Lowe's book is available from booktopia.com.au right now.